The real reason that Chinese manufacturers succeeded was because of the supply chain advantage. Not only could they get to convince a glass manufacturer to locate next door to their module manufacturing facility, but they could also get half a dozen of the suppliers within 100 mile radius to be competing on very low pricing. On June 23rd, the day we're recording this podcast, Bloomberg ran a story indicating that the White House was planning to, quote, block some solar goods made in the Xinjiang region. How did Chinese firms come to dominate over 80% of the global solar supply chains? And what are some companies trying to do to ensure that those supply chains are clean? To discuss, we have on Andy Klump, founder and CEO of Clean Energy Associates, a company that provides quality assurance to the solar supply chain and has recently expanded into ESG audits. Joining us also today is Paul von Brenkelen, Director of ESG and Traceability at Clean Energy Associates. They're both based in Shanghai. Andy and Paul, welcome to China Talk. So Andy, first off, how did you get in the China solar game? My path to China started roughly 20 years ago when I took a trip to Southeast Asia and I was just fascinated with Asia. I made a decision during business school that I would shift my career towards, uh, towards China and in 2002, started my career working with, uh, with Intel. After finishing business school, I joined, joined Dell Computer in 2003 in, in Beijing. So I've been living and working in China for the last 18 years and have been uh, spending the, the bulk of my time over the last uh, 15 years in the solar and energy storage supply chain. So that's when I first worked at Trina Solar for two years as their vice president of business development and the last 15 years as the CEO and founder of uh, Clean Energy Associates. Let's go back to those early days at when Trina Solar and SunTech were the names. How did these firms start? And at what point did Beijing realize that this is something um, that could potentially be really important to the future of China's economy? So I, I will say that Trina was actually one of the, uh, the early stage pioneers in the solar industry and first established itself in 1997. They moved into mainstream uh, solar module manufacturing in 2004 and 5, and I became involved at that early stage when the company was not in the same same realm as SunTech. It was it was still a tier three company, and many people had never heard of. They just had about 500 workers in the company. In those two uh, two years I spent there, uh, the company grew about 10x almost every metric, and I was instrumental in really helping build out their overall supply chain strategy. At that point in time, Trina was not known not only by buyers of solar modules, but also of the, the suppliers. And so one of the biggest challenges that Trina faced in 2006 was procuring polysilicon supply. So that was my primary focus for the two plus years I was there. I led a team that was involved with you know, strategic procurement of all long-term polysilicon agreements. And we had a very large effort to get the company on the mainstream stage. Over the past few months, there have been increasing reports of forced labor in the polysilicon supply chain, which is what has caught the White House's attention and led to today's Bloomberg story. So, Andy, how do you buy polysilicon in 2006? And how has that changed in the past 15 years? Back in 2006, there was an oligopoly of effectively five suppliers controlling 90% of the supply chain. And these were American, German, Italian, and uh, Japanese facilities with virtually nothing uh, made in China. At the time, the cost was roughly about $30 per kilogram. And the selling price at the time was about $150 to $200 per kilogram in the spot market. The accelerated interest in solar in 2008 and 2000 or 2007 to 2008 led to a polysilicon spot market pricing that accelerated all the way up to $475 per kilogram. So 90 plus percent margin in the product. And it was highly sought after by every single major manufacturer of solar and solar modules. To understand this full supply chain, it's polysilicon is the key upstream material, then ingots, wafers, cells, and modules are manufactured. So Trina being vertically integrated from ingots all the way through modules, they had to buy polysilicon. So that's why I was engaged. It was a very convoluted process. Many of the, the short-term buyers had to go through uh, traders and various other intermediaries, but it was a, a complete mess. The industry has matured. And so the, the total industry size has grown by about 100x in the last 15 years. <laughs> and the size of the plants uh, are, are just at a completely different scale. When you talk about 50,000 metric ton facilities, the whole industry was roughly that size back in the early days. And so, I will also mind you, uh, just highlight that the industry was focused on semiconductor, semiconductor wafer players uh, as the major offtake. So solar was just literally 1% of overall polysilicon supply. 
now the whole industry's flipped and it's uh, it's dominated by solar. Sure. One of the things that happened as that industry grew 100x was those those German, American, and Japanese firms really lost out to Chinese suppliers. So what about the the Chinese firms and the Chinese market allowed them to compete or I guess outcompete of Western silica, polysilicon? So I would I would highlight maybe it wasn't just Chinese manufacturers but also other Asian suppliers who uh, entered this space. Sure. The Koreans uh, were extremely large uh, for uh, for a period of time. But eventually, yes, that the market did migrate to China. But there still are a number of polysilicon facilities that are operating in the U.S. and in, certainly in Korea as well. But there are, but the market, and once again, is still 85, 90 plus percent centered in China. And to answer your question, a lot of the cost from polysilicon is really in the electricity, and so uh, having a lower cost of electricity is a key point of competitive advantage. But also, the supply chain is extremely robust in China now. At that time, there was actually very few manufacturers of the actual polysilicon, the core equipment around the bell jar that that basically actually changes the gas to a a solid. And so a lot of the core equipment around the supply chain was listed with just just really only just concentrated with very few manufacturers. And that industry supply chain has become much more, much more advanced. And that's where I think the Chinese suppliers of a lot of the long lead time equipment are now in a major position to to grow and scale. But there's still, at that time, it was about a three-year lead time to set up a new polysilicon facility that's now been uh, shrunk down to 18 months and maybe in some cases 15 months. But, you know, I'd say the supply chain advantages of China have been really what uh, would help the industry accelerate along with lower cost uh, forms of electricity. Sure. So is that 18 month time scale available to non-Chinese manufacturers? For the existing incumbents who have the core tech process technology and the teams and the know-how, it can be. However, for someone who is entering the, the business in a brand new capacity, it is likely going to take longer than 18 months. So you have to think in the context of, of what a polysilicon facility is like. I would think of this as a, as a giant petrochemical facility with giant pipes and distillation towers that are you know 10 or 12 stories tall. You're talking about a minimum capex of a billion dollars just to get to a, a basic facility of around 20,000 metric tons. So the the amount of money and the and the resources needed is quite substantial. And so that's where it really is only very large, well-established, well-capitalized firms who can really enter this space. But that's the, those are the barriers to entry that it certainly existed back then, but I'd say the barriers to entry have gone up uh, since then. Let's take a step back. One of the reasons you said that the Chinese policy, polysilicon industry has grown so dramatically was because the rest of the industry was grown so dramatically. So what? let's do the first five years of maybe your involvement going from 2006 to 2011. What were some of the key developments that started this industry down an exponential growth curve? So I would back up uh, to 2003, really, when you saw the first true policy support that came out of Germany with the uh, the EEG, which is effectively a law that promoted the adoption of uh, renewable energy in in Germany. And it started in a very small, a small scale way, but then the German market really took off in 2004, 2005, and then many other others in Europe uh, supported with pretty strong subsidies. That allowed the market to to peak at very high levels in 2008. So, how were those subsidies structured? Uh, so it was effectively a feed-in tariff or a FIT, which effectively was paid. The owner of the project would essentially get a, a very large payment for the production of, of solar energy. And so, these are for the developers of the systems. It's kind of the solar systems or the rooftop owners. But that, that solar module benefit, once again, went throughout the whole value chain and, and caused you know, massive growth of the industry, particularly during the 2000, you know, 2005 to 2008 era. And then going into this five-year time horizon you were suggesting to 2011, there was then a massive drop in the, with the global financial crisis in 2008 and early 2009. The industry fell off a cliff. The largest market at the time was Spain and effectively went from 50% of the global market to zero almost overnight. And then, then the market rebounded once pricing dropped, and that's where polysilicon pricing I mentioned was at $475 per kilo at the peak, and then dropped uh, you know, all the way down to uh, roughly to $100 per kilo back in 2009 and 10. And then all of a sudden, the growth in Italy in 2011 actually took the, the polysilicon pricing back up to the mid-100s, and there was a, a resurrection of higher-priced polysilicon. But since 2011 until now, 
or I should say in early 2021, pricing dropped quite dramatically. And that's where pricing effectively dropped like 95% over that period. Which is incredible. Oh, absolutely. You know, but it was an artificial bubble that was driven by a lot of excessive uh, subsidies. And there was this oligopoly that existed within these kind of five core suppliers. And so with limited supply and limited expansion, it led to this aberration on pricing. Once there were new players that jumped into the industry in 2007 and eight, led by the Koreans, but then the, the Chinese uh, players, some major players like GCL got in the business, then the market started to correct. And there was a lot of high cost manufacturers who still were making money at 100 or $150 per kilo. But a lot of these players then went out of business after 2011, 2012, when the market started to correct again. And then pricing uh, dropped all the way down to the sub $10 per kilo level at the depths of, of this period. But the industry has streamlined its cost and really reduced both uh, the CapEx and the OpEx to get to a much more you know, price sensitive level. And so even when pricing was in the $10, $12 per kilo range, some folks were making some money, at least you know, able to cover their cash costs. Now we've seen polysilicon pricing jump back up and that's, that's where we stand today. Yeah, Andy, I gotta say, I'm very happy my livelihood doesn't depend on commodity super cycles because I can't imagine how many heart attacks have been caused by this one and many others. <laughs> um, uh, so how did the Chinese solar industry more broadly fare coming in and out of the global financial crisis? Coming out of the global financial crisis, you, you, one, one has to think about the solar market in the context of what's going to this kind of constant supply and demand shift and in, in struggle. And so part of the, the interesting dynamic with solar is that the cost being so exorbitantly high, many people wrote it off and never thought it was a, really a mainstream form of energy. But with, with the dr massive drop in cost, so does the mar did the market applications open up and more and more folks adopted solar. The, so the let's say on the, so what was, so there are incredible charts of the cost of solar starting out in the early 2000s being like 10x what you can get for coal or oil. And now it's lower. What, what were the, what, were, what in your view were the main drivers of this truly you know, remarkable and likely world changing cost curve. So if I look back in my uh, early days at Trina, 2006, seven and eight, during that period, polysilicon was responsible for over 90% of the cost of the solar module. Gotcha. And so yeah. when all of a sudden your core commodity then drops in pricing by over 95%, then a lot of other things start to become more important. And so then uh, the other components of the solar module involving EVA, backsheet, the non-core silicon substrate, which is uh, derived from polysilicon. Then some of these other components uh, became a higher point in attention. Once again, silver paste is also one of the key components that's on the solar cell. But over the course of the last 15 years, all of these components have gone through massive pricing pressures. And that's where the overall China supply chain advantage has really helped to allow the, the industry get to a cost level that makes it uh, appealing for many forms of energy. So you're absolutely right. Solar used to be 10x the cost of coal, and now solar on a non-subsidized basis is actually less expensive than many forms of thermal energy. So the, the positive silver lining in all of this is that the market for solar has grown massively. I Just to show the 100x number, I, I was not joking. At the time I entered the industry, it was 1.6 gigawatts for the entire global industry. And, and now here we are more than 160 gigawatts. So that's what's led to the growth. We talked about the sort of German subsidies to kick off the industry in the early 2000s. How important was were were Chinese government subsidies to keep the industry running? So there, the the China's Chinese market in 2000 prior to 2010 was all sub one gigawatt. So it was a very small market that was inconsequential. So there was effectively no subsidies in place to support the deployment of solar on a large scale basis really until 2014, 15, and 16, when all of a sudden solar kind of jumped into the, the main mainstream. And at that, during that period, China went from nearly being not even the top 50 places of, of importance to all of a sudden becoming the, the world's largest market. And it peaked in 2017 with 53 gigawatts of, of overall the you know, deployment. So at that point in time, the subsidy scheme in China was driven by getting as, as many large utility scale projects in place. 
and uh, drove the market to become not only the largest market from a production standpoint, but also from an end demand standpoint. The global financial crisis specifically was uh, was not as, as detrimental in, in 2008 and 2009 as, uh, as what one, one would expect. Many manufacturers did not go out of business as thought there was not a massive consolidation in the industry. Many struggled and were not profitable for a period of time, but they basically lowered their utilization, hunkered down, waited through the, the downturn, and then, then the market rebounded in Europe, led by Italy in 2011, then Germany in 2012 and, and 13. And then when these larger, higher subsidized markets in Europe went offline after 2013 and 14, that's when China stepped in and started to build an end market from, from a demand standpoint. There, I, I will, to, to the second part of the equation is on the manufacturing side. There obviously have been local government incentives, you have various tax breaks or support of land acquisition to build out manufacturing facilities. But I wouldn't say that's just China. I would say that's a global phenomenon. We've sure. seen that in the U.S. and other places that also have manufacturing subsidies to incentivize uh, local manufacturing job creation. So that's something that's really happened globally. It's not just uh, just in China. So, of course, Andy, Bell Labs invented this stuff in the first place. Like for the, the first kind of 30 plus, who is it? Jimmy Carter had some solar panels on his White House. There were 30, 40 years there where it was basically American and to a lesser extent, Japanese R&D really driving the increase in, in efficiency of photovoltaic cells. So how did the American market and uh, U.S. manufacturers evolve over? over the subsequent decades. Looking at Bell Labs back in the 1950s, the, the first uh, solar photovoltaic effect was, uh, we're talking about the Einstein era. This is, the knowledge of the importance of solar is not something that started with our modern day generation, but it wasn't really until PV cells were made in the 1950s and they were really driven by some niche applications in space in the 60s and 70s. We're on a per watt basis, is, which is how the module market, solar module market, defines its its cost. We were talking about 30 or 40 US dollars per watt. And these were just used in space applications for satellites. Once again, a very niche market. And that's that's all the, the, the way the market operated. Then in the 70s, late 70s, with, with Jimmy Carter putting solar panels in the White House, there was this rebirth of the importance of, of solar energy and looking at uh, alternatives to uh, to oil given the given driven by the oil crisis and so out of that period there was a lot of innovation in the US major companies uh, SolarX were acquired by BP so actually one of our, our vice president of technology Paul Wormser who's been in solar for 45 years he actually started working at Exxon Mobil in their uh, their solar division so there actually were major oil companies involved in solar exploration in the 70s and 80s and for a while, the U.S. market did grow. Uh, and actually, just as another small diatribe, I will also say that there was a lot of growth of the, of, I'd say, illicit plant industry in the U.S. And a lot of these were driven by off-grid solar farms because they wanted to be undetected. That actually was, that was the, uh, the origin of the industry back in the, the 70s was space and space and marijuana. But you know, the market then, it was very small in the 80s. And then the Japanese started to, to pick up on, can we, can we on solar there? in the 90s. Um, oh, sure. Have you told that story to Chinese manufacturers? What is their what sort of responses have you gotten? I, so no, no, actually, I, I've not told. I told that that, that story about the uh, that part of it, but but that actually is true. So there were there were a lot of drug dealers who were uh, <laughs> involved in in using solar and deploying solar. So if you talk to folks in the industry in the '70s, like that was it. They were selling off grid solar modules to folks who were growing Mary Jane in the back alleys of, of Colorado and California. So that, that is a true story. But the interesting part is actually, you know, China did have some small solar industry in like the 70s, but it was just, it was very small R&D labs, just hardly anything. Yeah, I, I think that'd be a stretch to go through and translate all that to the Chinese. So I've actually never told that story. Just yeah. back to the 70s and 80s. So you know, so solar module manufacturing, there there was a, a few limited players, and they measured the offtake of their of their facilities in almost kilowatts per. The whole overall industry was less than you know, just a few megawatts during this era. But with the advent of, of SolarX being acquired by BP I, Solar, I'm sorry, and the I'm oil sorry for the uh, ignorant among us. Can we get the layman's? What's a kilowatt, megawatt, gigawatt? Okay, yes, yes. A watt, so for the sake of, of those who are not familiar with the industry, a watt of energy from a solar panel is, is basically the unit of the unit of electricity that, or the unit of energy that, that folks will equate to. So we measure the, the solar modules or the solar panels, that is, in terms of watts. 
and then once again, 1,000 watts equals one kilowatt, 1,000 kilowatts equals one megawatt, and then uh, 1,000 megawatts equals one gigawatt. So the, I know the U.S. is not uh, big in the metric system, but this is, uh, this is the foundation for the industry. So the overall industry was just, a, I mentioned 100x growth. Uh, I was talking about when it reached the 1.6 gigawatt level. But when you look at this, the 70s and 80s, I, I think the industry was literally less than 10 or 20 uh, megawatts during that early era. Oh, so sorry. It was a so like very a megawatt, industry. like... I, I, like a megawatt can power 10 houses. Can we do that one too? Just a base form of reference, roughly uh, 5,000 watts or about five kilowatts is the size of a maybe average East Coast home in uh, installation. So yes, gotcha. so you know, if you're looking at uh, a one megawatt, sure, then there's potentially 200 homes at that size. California and others may see a little bit higher, uh, higher deployments of 7,000 watts or seven kilowatts but it's more or less in that range gotcha okay so we were not very small bore niche in the 70s and 80s how did u.s manufa how did u.s manufacturers fare as chinese firms started to getting into the game in the 2000s and 2010s yeah so if you have to then look into the 90s i would say japan then outstripped the u.s and getting more attention. That's where companies like Sharp and Panasonic got involved in solar. Japan was actually supporting the industry. So there was actually a lot of growth in the late 90s with Japanese firms. And there were subsidies in place to support Japanese solar deployment because Japan being an island nation had very high cost of electricity. Prior to 2003 or four, China module manufacturing was less than 1% of the overall industry. So very rudimentary, very small shops. And SunTech didn't even exist before 2002. And Trina hadn't been in module manufacturing at that point in time. So the time that the EEG was announced in, in Europe, or in, I'm sorry, in Germany, that subsidy drove the industry to suddenly pay attention to solar. And once SunTech went public on the New York Stock Exchange in 2005, then everyone realized, hey, there are firms that can go make money at this. And for a while, Dr. Xi, or Xi Jinping, he became a, a multi-billionaire in China. And then everyone said, hey, I want to do that too. And then you saw hundreds of companies that dove into this industry and the competition really emerged. So this is in this SunTech being founded in 2002, three, and four, and it's starting to ramp up during that time was the early stage of that. By the time I entered the industry in 2006, module manufacturing was still less than 5%. Less than 5% of global module manufacturing came from China. So why weren't the, Amer why weren't the American and German firms able to scale at the rate and speed that the Chinese ones were? So during the 20, sorry, the 2003 to 2006 era, there were some module manufacturers in the US and Germany that did grow in scale and were significantly larger than the Chinese. But the real ascension of the major Chinese manufacturers that we know today happened during this period because they did start to ramp up. They did go public on the New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ. They you know, collected capital and they put all their money into CapEx, which then led to a large, a large expansion of the supply chain. And the real reason the Chinese manufacturers succeeded was because of the supply chain advantage. Not only could they get convince a glass manufacturer to locate next door to their module manufacturing facility, but they could also get half a dozen of the suppliers within a hundred mile radius to be competing on very low pricing. And so that competition drove others to say, okay, we'll give you just in time inventory right next door. And so you don't have to put any your working capital into the equipment or into the, the raw material components. Whereas U.S. manufacturers still had a, a very small scale operation. They did not have subcomponent suppliers that were as aggressive or able to lower their cost. And so as a result, the industry shifted towards China for some parts of it. And that's where polysilicon, because of the high barriers to entry, the very high levels of process technology and know-how, the large scale investment of billions of dollars as opposed to just tens of millions of dollars uh, of CapEx, uh, capital expenditure, that led to uh, polysilicon not shifting over to China until later. But the core parts of the supply chain, as I mentioned, the ingots, wafers, cells, and modules, that then uh, shifted to China more, more quickly at first. 
So one argument you're coming out of some industry folks and, and think tanks is the fact that these Chinese firms heavily weighted to CapEx spending and spent less as a percentage, percentage of their firms on R&D. And the argument goes that the scale at which these Chinese firms the scale and speed at which these Chinese firms grew locked us into a technical scenario where the photovoltaic cells weren't as efficient as they could have been had firms spent more money, firms like the Western ones spent more money into R&D. Do you buy this line of thinking? So first of all, I want to dissect the different uh, facets of the industry because we're talking about kind of mainstream commodity-based manufacturing of some of the, the core components. And one has to understand that the industry always knew there would be a large commoditization of the product and that commoditization drove the industry's cost down, allowed the industry to go through this 100x growth. But keep in mind that there were a number of U.S. and European manufacturers of a lot of the core equipment that sold all their equipment to the manufacturers in China. That's what allowed the industry to grow and expand. And so there was a lot of R&D that did come in from Western firms, but some of this was on the capital equipment side. Hmm. And that's actually what drove innovation that then you know went on a global basis. So many manufacturers of the core equipment still had an upper hand for a number of years and did make uh, very nice margins for a long period of time as Chinese manufacturers expanded. The second part of the equation that did benefit U.S. firms is the fact that this low cost solar panel or the solar module allowed the downstream part of the industry to grow massively. And so the amount of jobs in solar in the U.S. today is well over hundreds of hundreds of thousands because this low cost equipment could then be installed by many electricians, technicians, other workers, blue collar workers throughout the industry. And that industry still remains very robust and is a major form of, uh, of new job creation within the U.S. So that, that is also a key part of the growth of the, of the industry. There's also a lot of, of other you know, services firms around this, a lot of areas related to financing and business model innovation. That's where the U.S. continues to you know, dominate the growth of that. That's not something that can be outsourced. Sure. So there's massive job growth that's resulted from the fact that the, the manufacturing base has shifted to a lower cost operation. The second major theme I'd also say on the manufacturing side, which is noteworthy, is that not all modules are made uh, using crystalline technology, although that is the dominant form of the industry. There have been some manufacturers of thin film technology, and that's a very different manufacturing process. So First Solar, based in Ohio, is one of the largest thin film manufacturers, but the thin film technology has been adopted in many markets around the world, but it's only been really deployed in scale by First Solar. And First Solar, have, they have facilities both in the U.S. as well as in Malaysia and also in Vietnam. So they have actually grown both with Asian-based facilities as well as the U.S.-based. So it's important to note there still are some manufacturing jobs that are happening in the U.S., and there's other smaller uh, mid-sized firms that are involved in solar cell and module manufacturing that do exist in the U.S. And some of those have been Asian-based firms. So companies like Hanwha and Jinko Solar have also invested in Georgia as well as in Florida with uh, U.S.-based manufacturing facilities. So there, there still is a niche for you know, some, some folks to manufacture in the U.S. as well. Andy, you spent some time in the, in the semiconductor industry. What parallels do you see in you know, terms of China building up fabs and whatnot from the, the solar to the chip space? There are a lot of parallels, and there have been a lot of shifts from the semiconductor industry into, into solar. The industry core technology it does, it does require a pretty dynamic supply chain, but there's a lot of innovation and ongoing R&D that's needed, but I would just say the the, the core where the I'd say where the, the technology differs is the level of complexity in solar is not nearly as as uh, sophisticated as what the semiconductor industry is. So that's where the barriers to entry arguably are are much much smaller on the solar side. So while there there are a lot of parallels with respect to Moore's law and the doubling of capacity equates to lower manufacturing cost and a lot of those, a lot of that industry uh, the economies of scale, industry growth and economies of scale have been achieved and they're gonna continue to be achieved. I would say there is some limitation because the core technology is, is also quite different, but that's, that, that's where I, I think a, a lot of companies who have been very large, even companies like Intel tried to get into this space. G was in the module manufacturing space for a while. 
We saw BP go in and out twice. But I think the challenge for a lot of these large multinationals is the margins are very thin when the market's in a, a good era. But when there's an over any amount of oversupply, the margins you know, turn to be negative and become a quite challenged. So it's not a, a space for these, these typical high margin businesses. The companies like Intel just were not destined to be in solar for a long time. Yeah. And you're not, you're, there's you're not no, cashing no surprise. In on, on, on three nanometer chips and whatnot. Yep, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, um, coming to today's news. First off, let's do some context on Clean Energy Associates. What do you guys do and how are you and, and how does the sort of how has the sort of supply chain verification work you guys done connected you to, to today's news? We are an engineering services company. And so our core work is we help people to buy products. We inspect products in the factory. We then verify that they're installed properly in the field. And then we have a team that tracks all the data and market intelligence throughout all the work that we do. Great. So with respect to supply chain transparency and traceability, our teams have the ability to go all the way uh, upstream to the core materials, check where the materials are from, and then actually help our clients understand and validate the components that they're receiving. Paul, how does this work? So if you think about what is tracking and tracing or traceability in the photovoltaic supply chain, it goes back to our clients. So it would mean if a client is a module manufacturer, then we would go to the sites and start tracking and tracing throughout the premises of that company using like incoming materials documents, warehousing, the production lines, inventory and the related systems being used. So we can check the computer systems, we can uh, check documentary flows, we can use barcodes used in, inside the systems, uh, inside the client premises. Uh, but we would do like a walk around, we would speak with people, uh, interview the different subjects in the organization. Uh, the site visit is important so we can really see what people tell us uh, is there or what procedures have been written up are being implemented. Uh, and we would take samples uh, during the tour in the sense of, you know, we are in a warehouse, we pull a few boxes or we pull individual, individual units out of those boxes and ask them to show us where they did end up in the final product either up or down. So that is how such a process would work. And based on the capabilities and, and the know-how of the staff uh, inside CEA and, and their technical know-how and technical capabilities, they will be able to look at certain, let's say, critical control points in the organization. It has to be sample-based because we cannot spec like inspect or assess anything and everything. We need to make a calculated choice to look into something. Sure. So, Andy, how has the industry responded to allegations of, of forced labor and what it, and how has that response evolved over the past uh, year or so? So the core, our core customers are the end developers or IPPs, which is independent power producers or the engineering procurement construction companies, EPCs. They're the ones who are often buying the modules and installing them. So their requests are for us to understand the traceability of all the subcomponents of the core modules. And the manufacturers themselves uh, are not our clients, but we're doing the inspection work at their facilities. So there are many manufacturers who are willing to help support the request, but they also are somewhat reluctant to give us all the information that we're looking for. So there's been a, a little back and as uh, we go through and, and talk through this, keep in mind that the manufacturer of a solar panel or a solar module, they may make the cells and the module, but they don't necessarily make the, the wafers or the, in almost all cases, they don't make polysilicon. There's probably one or two exceptions of folks that are integrated from upstream polysilicon all the way to modules, but most manufacturers are buying from other subcomponent suppliers and the problem that exists in the industry is that traceability requires them to go through and check with their suppliers. And that's where the, the reaction has been mixed. Some subcomponent suppliers are willing to provide the data and information and others are more reluctant to do so. Sure. So what is the kind of political economy of that reaction? Not naming firms, but who, which firms tend to be more, what makes a firm more likely to be more gung-ho about addressing this um, versus more reluctant? Well, I think. Part of, part of the challenge is that the manufacturers themselves require some amount of, of incentive to, to go through and do this extra work because historically they've not been asked to do this. So I'll introduce a term called uh, MES, which is Manufacturing Execution System. These are part of the, the traceability protocol that we've identified is to have a check 
at the manufacturing level of what their MES uh, states, where the components are from. And the problem that we have encountered is that some of the, the manufacturing execution systems that exist only show the product within the walls of that manufacturer. So that may be the cells and the modules, maybe it's all the way to the wafers or the ingots, but as I said, the polysilicon manufacturers themselves don't have an MES, which then connects with the downstream module manufacturers MES. So the polysilicon manufacturers themselves don't have the system in place, but they're willing to go through and do this in some cases, but they also want additional, additional support in terms of the cost because it does require more work on their side. So one of the gaps is that we've been hearing that these suppliers are asking for more money to do uh, this traceability work. I would also paint this in the picture that the large majority of the industry does happen in Xinjiang. We're certainly aware of that. But for the size of the U.S. market, is it, while it's growing and it's large, there's actually more than three times the amount of polysilicon supply in regions outside of Xinjiang. So that's areas like Inner Mongolia, Sichuan, uh, you know, Qinghai and other provinces. They have polysilicon, which can meet more than 3x the size of the U.S. market demand. So each manufacturer can go through and separate where they get their products from and give that traceable information to their customers. Some have not been preparing up to this point, and so they, they now need to invest further in their systems and their efforts to do this. Others have been doing this traceability work but it, there is additional cost to, to, to installing this these systems and operating them. So it's doable and it's annoying to create two streams of one with Xinjiang polysilicon, presumably for domestic Chinese consumption and rest of the world consumption, and then another one for for the U.S. And the cost and the cost increase is like somewhat is not going to make solar more screw up like solar economics more broadly, but it's a question of a few cents of who of who is going to end up footing the bill. Correct. There are some some numbers that could be anywhere from one penny a watt to two or you know, two and a half pennies a watt. The The question really is what's the scale at which this is done and how, how many folks are you know, requesting certain uh, certain items and what the, the depth of those of those requirements are. So a lot of this is is something that the industry is working through right now. But that uh, anywhere from a four to 10% price increase is a substantial uptick in cost. And particularly now in the industry as there have been cost increases in polysilicon already as well as uh, logistics cost, that those are, it's a big price increase that, that many buyers are unwilling to, to take as well. The, the clients of CEA are uh, the developers, uh, IPPs, EPCs, and the financial institutions. So those are the people who uh, contact CEA to deliver those services related to traceability, uh, for example, Jordan. What is a solar developer? A solar developer is uh, much way that uh, one thinks about real estate development. A solar developer is someone who secures land. They have to secure the permits. They have to have all of the proper uh, steps to ensure that a solar farm or a solar plant can actually be uh, installed at a certain location. But that developer is effectively putting that whole financing package and a delivery package together to allow energy for the solar modules to be installed into a system that then produces energy to an off taker. Gotcha. And that's anyone who's consuming energy. Gotcha. That's where you see large corporates like Google, Amazon, many others that want renewable energy from solar. They're working with developers to meet those needs. Sure. So it may not just be the US which ends up taking some action in regards to Xinjiang and, and, and polysilicon. How do the dynamics change if more OECD countries end up signing up for some form of, of import restrictions? So there are certainly a number of, of other geographies that are interested in this inquiry. And so the European, many European manufacturers, or sorry, European uh, customers who are developers and independent power producers are asking for our traceability work as well. But the, the legislation in the U.S. is really focused on, I think is a little bit ahead at this point. So I think the U.S. is likely to, to happen first, but then you're absolutely right. Uh, Europe and other regions are also likely to follow suit. But I think the on the flip side, if you look at the growth of the polysilicon industry, many polysilicon manufacturing plans are happening outside of the province we're talking about. So many plants are happening, expansions are happening right now in Sichuan, Inner Mongolia, 
Yunnan, Qinghai, and a lot of other regions uh, are seeing massive growth. And so if we look at the overall industry, you know, the industry is measured in metric tons, we're seeing the industry more or less double in less than two years. So of roughly 550,000 metric tons that existed in 2020, we're at 600,000 metric tons today. Next year is projected to be over 900,000 metric tons of capacity. And by 2023, 1.2 million metric tons. And a vast majority of these expansions are happening outside of Xinjiang. So even if the entire global production or customer demand you know, comes and says they want traceability, all these new expansions will be, you know, be more than enough to meet the global market need in the coming two to three years. Coming back to the sort of what if everyone shuts off the Xinjiang polysilicon tap, does that one to two and a half pennies a watt price increase, like the four to the five to 10% for the end customer, does that increase or decrease because then more companies get with the program and then you end up having more like Xinjiang free supply? I guess the answer is like over time, I definitely expect them to decrease. But I, I think that's maybe the initial ask because of the amount of work and effort that's needed. But I, I do expect that over time, numbers will be less than a penny a watt. But the answer really comes down to what are the process re required by the US government and other regions that have traceability protocols in place. And so the more in depth the inspection work or the more owners the requirements, the higher that cost threshold could be. Yeah. So that's where I will say over time, as more and more manufacturers of modules prove that they're buying polysilicon from Sichuan or other regions, then I think these costs will, will eventually become much, much smaller and less material. Sure. And there's also a, a potential future where it's not just the U.S. government mandating a supply chain verification. It's also them cutting off large Chinese manufacturers um, who have been um, accused of allegations of using forced labor to the U.S. market. And I imagine when, again, this is speculation, but once you pick a handful of you know, enormous, of really large Chinese players in the supply chain, then the sort of like end cost to the U.S. customer ends up increasing much more than just doing the just doing the verification. Uh, correct. So it's it's not that all these costs are borne on in terms of the verification costs. It is also what is the investment in the the system and the the internal resources needed to execute some of this work. Many of these manufacturers are very well versed in these type of topics. There's not this is not the first time there's been a regulatory change. If one looks back uh, to the Obama administration as early as 2013 you know, tw uh, and 14, there were a variety of tariffs in place on solar. Uh, the industry had to adjust and adapt. There's a lot of paperwork and other legal and, and other regulatory preparation that's needed. So all these manufacturers will bear a lot of costs on how they prepare and develop their systems to meet the market need. So those are also factors that, that play in this broader equation. But also understand there's sensitivities as well the, the Chinese government has, has stated that manufacturers should not be adjusting their systems based on other government state. And so there is a, a period where there's a little bit of a stalemate where manufacturers can't openly acknowledge that this is their, their change of approach. They're also abiding by Chinese regulatory rules, but obviously they also want to abide by American regulatory rules. But these are all private organizations that have a business interest in trying to meet the needs of the market. But there are solutions uh, that are needed, to, but some of this base is based on what, what regulatory frameworks and requirements are, are coming out. Taking this back to the traceability work that Clean Energy Associates have, has done, we work closely for six months with the Solar Energy Industries Association in drafting a supply chain protocol. That protocol was announced and released in late April. So that is a very large document that the CA has spent you know, a lot of time on. We have three PhDs, all with manufacturing experience throughout the value chain, as well as Paul Wormser, our vice president of technology, who helps support the, the drafting of this. But that's part of the 40-person team that CA has in the U.S. was working on these regulatory frameworks and trying to help support the industry growth. Yeah, I was. this was going to be my next question is because you had this very striking, awkward moment of the American industry associated and saying, this is a problem, we got to do something about it. And the Chinese industry association saying, in Chinese, what are you talking about? We're doing just fine. Don't criticize us. We're great. And figuring out how to thread this needle, like basically 
it, it, it seems like there is a, a, a steady state equilibrium where American and potentially European and Japanese panel needs are supplied by supply are supplied supplied by supply chains which don't go through Xinjiang, but that is that is contingent on the Chinese government letting letting these firms make the sort of adjustments that are going to be required for Western capitals and consumers to feel comfortable buying this product. Yes, no, absolutely. It is a it is an unusual circumstance, and there's a lot of reluctance by either side to to back down. But there's a, effectively a different view on terms of labor practices, uh, what one considers to be ethical or, or acceptable versus others. And so that's where there are some some macro differences of opinion. Everyone is very clear. They they want to have growth in the solar energy industry. That's there's no doubt about it. And the industry will evolve towards the solution that, that meets that need. I, as I said, the, there's a lot of growth of polysilicon in other regions where this is not uh, a concern. And so the market will evolve towards, uh, towards those, uh, those regions that, that kind of meet those needs. So we do think that the market will adapt and, uh, and change. But we have to wait for some of these regulatory frameworks to come in place. Sure. Another point I'd like yeah. to make is that uh, there has been a demand in the market, initially driven by France, but then later also in Korea, for low carbon modules. And so a number of manufacturers have uh, adjusted their supply chain. They've sourced ingots and wafers from Norway and other locations that have low carbon footprints or they're powered by hydro. So just as an example, like that has been a policy that's been out there for several years and a number of major manufacturers shifted and they're able to sell their products at a premium.